Okay, so planning your fleece to fiber project. What I'd like to cover in this class is how to plan and execute a successful fleece to frock project. Important project details to consider and how to learn from my past mistakes, which are many. <laughs> I started doing my first project a couple years in after I started spinning and I learned a lot from that. And hopefully I can share that with you and help you to do your project uh, with a, not having done some of those mistakes. So my first piece of advice is to do your research up front. Um, it may be tempting to just jump right in and start spinning and do all the fun things, but really it's the best way to go. Um, doing your research up front, you're going to get a better idea of how you should proceed. If you're going to research as you go, you may find you have used a technique or tool that's not compatible with a later step in the process. When I did my first fleece to frock project, I just started spinning. I found a fleece that I liked. I carded it up. I started spinning it. And then when I did my research later, I realized for the time period I was doing it in, I really should have combed the fiber. Um, so that was something that easily, if I had done the research ahead of time, I wouldn't have made that mistake. Um, you may also find a better or more period or easier way to perform a task that you're planning on doing. You may find someone in your research that has done a similar project to what you've done and you can learn from their process. And when you're doing your research, please keep a list of your sources and page numbers. For me, my uh, fleece to frock projects can take several years sometimes, and I'm never gonna remember what book I found that piece of information in or what page it was on. So definitely uh, document all of that information for your bibliography later, but also just in case you have to go back and look for other things. Um, fill out a project checklist and stick to it. Now I'm going to show you um, my project checklist that I always do when I, before I start a project. And it's something that really helps me. And um, I'll give you a copy so hopefully it can help you too. Um, the checklist will let you know what areas will require your research. Um, it will also give you a list of materials that you need and you can use this to, term, to determine what you have and what you may need to purchase or borrow or make. Um, the checklist can help you answer questionnaires that are required of some arts and science competitions, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, another thing that the checklist can help you with is checking back often as you're going through your project on your original checklist, it'll help you avoid project creep. And if you don't know what that is, that's when you're working on a project and you're like, oh, you know, it'd be great if then I also did this. Oh, and then I could do this. And then before you know it, your project has become huge and um, unwieldy and you're completely off of track. And if you have the checklist, you check back to it, it'll keep you on track and focus on what it is you originally set out to do. When I'm doing a project, I always come up with more things that I want to be doing or different areas to research. What I do is I have a notebook that I keep with all the projects I want to do. And so if I come up with something, I'll write it down in that notebook, sometimes even write out an outline while I'm thinking about it. That kind of gets it out of my system and puts it off to another time. And it helps me from really getting off track, which can really sometimes keep you from ever completing the first the project in the first place because it's just become too big. So the first thing you're going to do when you're going to plan out your project is you're going to choose what garment you want to make. So it's kind of like we're going to the end first, but it's important because this is going to make a lot of help you make a lot of the decisions in the first place. So are you going the piece, the clothing that you're going to make? Is it from do you have an extant piece that you're modeling it after or are you using a painting? Um, it's going to be different decisions that you make based on which one you're using. What is the time period of the garment that you're making? What region is it from, if ap applicable? Um, the status of the person who's going to be wearing it, very important to how you make it. And what will you be doing while wearing it? Now, this may seem um, not, you know, like a kind of a frivolous thing, but if you're going to be wearing it and you're going to be doing certain things, it's really important because if I remember one year at Penzik, I was dressed all nice 
to go to opening ceremonies and I had a Norman dress with very long angel sleeves. And then after opening ceremonies, I was trying to cook lunch for my family and it was nearly impossible to be cooking in a camp with these long sleeves. So, um, you know, think about what you're gonna be doing in your garment. If it's just gonna be put on a dress form for an ANS competition, then that doesn't really, it doesn't matter as much. Uh, what color will your garment be? Will you be making or purchasing the pattern that you're gonna use for sewing it? Um, does it require a lining and will you be making that as well? And what embe embellishments will be required? Buttons, lacing, trim, all of these things. Think about that in the beginning so you can plan it all out. So here I have some sample garments from different sources. So all the way here on the left, we have, this is an extant piece. So um, this is for the second Fleece to Frock project that I'm making. Um, I wanna do a color work and I wanna put a plaid in there. So this is the time period that I want and it shows the plaid. Um, I took a picture of the book that I, I'm getting it from. Um, also have a photocopy this way. It, it has the name of the book and the, the, the page number. And also, um, I'll show you later how I, I keep that so I can always go back to it as I'm working. The middle picture here is from an illumination. Now with the illumination, it'll give you what it looks like, but it's not gonna tell you what type of weave you have in the fabric. It's not gonna tell you the wraps per inch. It's not gonna tell you how fine, how fine it is or the, the twist direction. So those are decisions that you're gonna make for yourself. Um, you're not going to have that to go with. Then on the all the way right side, this is another extant piece from the time period that I'm thinking about for my garment. Again, it shows the plaid, but it also shows buttonholes and buttons. So this is going to be really great, even though it's not a whole sleeve. It's going to be able to help me with those embellishments that I'm going to do, do on my dress. So this is, um, you know, some samples. So next, you've decided what your garment's gonna be. Now you're gonna choose your fiber. What type of fabric was typically used in this style? Is this something that was a wool or a cotton or a linen? Um, what fibers would have been available to that region at the time? So if you're doing a garment that's from England, you're gonna have different fibers that are available than if you're doing something from India or from China or from the Middle East. So think about what fibers they would have had available to them. Um, what fibers do you have available to you? It's very important because some sheep, some sheep breeds, while it might be a period sheep breed for what you're doing, it might be next to impossible for you to get, or it could be incredibly expensive. So while you're looking into it, um, also, you know, you have to make concessions to what you can afford and what you're able to get. Um, and how much are you willing to spend on the project? That's the, that's the next thing. So that's, that's all very important. Okay. So here's um, some pictures of fiber choice. So the, the fleece to frock, the second one, I keep saying the second one, I did one, the first one I did complete failure. Um, and what happened with that is I was really excited as they said, I wanted to do black Welsh mountain sheep. I found that sheep, I love the fiber. I got a fleece, started going right away, cleaned it, carded it, spun it, started weaving it and found that um, I wanted to make a dress and I wound up with 18 inch wide fabric that was four yards long, which was nowhere near enough. So then I bought another fleece, but now it's from a different a different animal, it was a different vendor, completely different quality. Uh, when I spun that, it was just, it looked so different, I couldn't use it. So my second one, I'm using uh, Jacob sheep, which while not technically a period breed, um, it is a sheep that they have bred to look like the ancient uh, horned sheep that are on some Syrian pottery in period. So it's a recreation breed. And I live in the modern lands of New Jersey and we have a lot of Jacob breeders here. So I feel like for me, that's my local sheep. Um, and a, you know, a person who was making a garment out of wool would use local, local sheep to her. So for me, I'm gonna use the Jacob. Plus I wanted, as I showed you, I wanted to do color work. And with the Jacob fleece, it's black and white, 
and then I'm gonna mix them together to get gray, I'll be able to do color work without doing any dyeing. Each fleece is about five pounds, not enough, now I know, to do one fleece to make a dress. So over time, it was a couple of years going to different fiber festivals. I have bought several, I think six or seven I have fleeces. The thing to do is to mix them up before you start. So I washed them right away. And then um, what I did is I sorted them. So I had all the black fleece together, all the white fleece together. And then I had bins with mixed up um, black and white, and then that'll be combed and that'll turn gray. When you mix it all up together, it doesn't, it's gonna all be homogeneous. You're not gonna have, it's not gonna be obvious that you have different qualities of fleece. So even if you're getting a fleece from the exact same sheep from year to year, there can be a lot of differences in the fleece based on weather and diet. And if the animal was sick, or even just as a sheep ages, their, their wool can, get, can become different. So it's better to, if you're gonna have to use more than one, do it all up front, mix it up, and then it won't look like you have, oh, this is from this fleece and that is from that fleece. So that's what my pictures are here. On the left-hand side, I have some documentation whenever I'm buying uh, a fleece and I'm at a fiber festival, if the shepherds have out things about their flock, um, I'll, I'll put it together. And that helps me not only remember where I bought um, the different fleeces from, but also have the information, which of course I always double check um, to make sure you know, it matches with what, what I've, I've researched as well. But I keep that together. I'll show you where, how I, how I keep all my information together as I'm researching. So the next step is how are you going to clean your fiber? What materials are you going to need? What equipment are you going to need? And where are you going to do it? Some people don't like to clean fiber and that's fine. Um, you need the right space for that. It's a dirty, dirty job. Um, and if you're going to use uh, buy stuff that's already cleaned or send it out to be cleaned, that's totally okay. Um, the way that I clean my fiber is not the period way. I use modern detergent because it's just in my space, it's just easier to do that. And um, so, you know, I research how it would have been cleaned and then I make a note of it and then how I'm going to clean it. So, but you know, you want to think about it upfront, how you're going to do it. And then stick to it. So if you decide you're gonna do it in a basin, do you even have a basin? You have to get one or, or something like that. So all things that you should do upfront. Here's how I wash. What, like I said, is a modern way to wash. I have laundry bags and I put my fleece in there so it doesn't move around too much and felt. And then I put it, I have buckets and um, I, I put it in the buckets with, I use unicorn scour, which is a modern, fleece cleaner um, and I soak it in hot water and then I rinse it and then you know I put more water and I do that a couple of times until it's clean and then I do it with just plain water and then I dry it downstairs in my basement I have a dehumidifier um, I put it in the basement on these drying racks it keeps the cats out of it if I was to dry outside I have a very small yard and I would have to secure it Otherwise our, our friendly neighborhood squirrel would be taking it for his nest and uh, the birds and stuff. So for me, this is how I do it. I document it, I take pictures of it. So it's all there, it's all there for the information. And um, you, know, you just decide how you're gonna do it. Fiber prep. So now you've decided your fiber, how you're gonna clean it, how are you gonna prepare it? Um, are you going to cart it? Are you going to comb it? Are you going to flick it? Are you just going to use the locks as they are? Is there another method that you're going to do? All things that you need to look and um, depending on different areas that, um, you know, if this is from a different region, they use different methods, different time periods. It was more popular to use one. Also, it matters on the length, you know, the length of the staples, the fiber. When I did my first project and I said I carted it, it really wouldn't have worked if I was going to comb it because the fleece that I got was not really great and it was the the locks were too short um and even though it was black Ma Welsh mountain sheep it was cut too short it would have never combed very well so there was so many things wrong with that first project so you want to make sure 
that your fiber prep not only is the period way that it would have been done, but also is compatible with the fiber that you're choosing to use. So if you're gonna do something with cotton, you know, you have to look at how you would prepare that. You're gonna to have to gin it, you're gonna to have to get the seeds out of it, you know, all those things, things you have to think about. So here is for my, my current project, how I am prepping my fiber. I've decided to comb it. And I read an article about how they would, some people would oil their, their fleece so that it would more easily comb. So rather than dip my combs into like fat um, and grease, I uh, read a, a modern article about spraying spraying down your, your locks with a mixture of water and I used olive oil. Um, so here I, all the way on the upper left, I have the combs that I'm using. And then in the center, I have the bottle of water that I'm misting my, my locks with. Then on the right-hand side is the olive oil bottle. And then you can see me on the bottom is the combing. So this is the mixture of the black and white fleece to make the gray color. Um, so there in the middle on the bottom is what the fleece looks like after it's, I think it's combed enough. And then all the way on the bottom right is what they looks like when it, when it's come off, when it's come off the combs, the beautiful fluffy, ready to spin uh, box. Now. Okay. So now we're going to think about how are you going to spin? You have to choose your equipment for spinning. Are you going to use a wheel? You're going to use a drop spindle? spindle? Um, or something different or a combination. Personally, if I'm doing a big project, I like to use the wheel because I don't have a lot of time to do spinning, um, but I always use the drop spindle as well. This way I can compare what the drop spindle uh, yarn looks like versus what the wheel spun looks like. Most of the time I can't tell the difference, but I like to put it next to it, you know, next to it to, to show what it, what it would look like. Um, what weight do you want the final yarn to be? And how many plies are you going to have? Is it gonna be two, three, four? You're gonna do a single, you could weave with singles, which is um, what I'm planning on doing. It's a little nerve wracking uh, to be weaving with a single. It can be more easy to break. We'll see if that works. And how many wraps per inch for your single and then for your plied yarn, all these things you should decide ahead of time you might do some sampling um, while, you know, before you actually decide, you might wanna be play, play around a little bit and, and do some sampling to see, see what you like, what works best for you. Um, what directions will the singles be spun and what direction will you ply if you're plying and what will be your process for setting your twist? All these things, um, you know, think about and, and decide up ahead. So here is some pictures of me spinning so the one all the way on the left is my Black Welsh Mountain Sheep, the first project that I did. Um, you can see if you look all the way on the bottom of that picture, on the right side, you can see the beautiful dark color on the Lazy Kate. Um, so this is me on my ladybug wheel. The middle picture is the current gray that I, that I spun after uh, I had combed all the fiber. And then all the way on the right side, I believe that's my Black Welsh mountain sheep, but I was at a demo uh, with the drop spindle. So I was, at a, I was at a demo, it was a timeline. So we had people from the Roman empire all the way to World War II. Um, and you could you know, go through the timeline. And it was interesting because uh, to show people spinning when spinning kind of is done the same way um, until we really got to the modern time with the machines, uh, you know, drop spindles used all the time, so. Um, so that was some of the, the sampling I did for that project. Now, are you going to dye your fabric? If you are going to dye your yarn or your fabric, uh, what is the mordant that you're going to be using? What will the ratio in yarn to, you know, mordant be? What dye will you be using? And what is the quantity of dye to fiber? Um, these are all things you need to think about. I'm not going to be dyeing my project right now, so we don't have to worry about it, but I've done other projects where I was dying. Um, and I'll, I'll, I have some pictures of that. So here's some examples. All the way on the right, uh, sorry, on the left in the upper corner is just some fiber reactive dye. This is acid dye, so you don't need a mordant with this. This is something that you would you can dye silk or cotton with. Um, in the middle 
top, I have some of my uh, powdered dye uh, dissolving. In the lower left, I have a picture of the dye pot with my thermometer hanging there. And then on the lower right, so this is, I was doing embroidery floss and I wanted to do some gradient color. So what I did is I had the dye pot and then I dyed a first skein of, of uh, yarn. Then I let that go. I took the second skein, put that in, it got a little lighter, did a third one, put that in, it got a little lighter still. So that was, you know, that was the plan to do that. Wrote everything down about the dye and what the concentration was and what the mordant was um, for that project before any, any yarn hit the dye pot. So let's talk about weaving. Maybe you're going to weave your final, your final project before you sew it. Uh, what equipment will you be using? What weave will you use on the, on the fabric? What will you be using for your warp? And what will you be using for your weft? Just some of the questions that you, you need to ask before you do some weaving. How much fabric width and length will you need to make? How much yardage are you going to need? And what will be the sizing on your warp thread if you're gonna be using a sizing? Um, these are, that's something that I'm currently working on. I have had a problem. I haven't found any, uh, any thing concrete on what warp sizing they've used. I have not found the documentation. I've had some anecdotal things that I've read on um, some things that I'm gonna try. And that's actually one of the things that was the, the project creep for this fleece to frock that I'm doing. I'm like, oh, maybe I should try different sizing and see how that comes out. That would be a really interesting thing to do. And I'm like, that would be really interesting to do as a separate project because <laughs> that would you know, make it a huge thing. So I did start my project um, without, just, I have something in mind that I'm going to do for the warp sizing. I think I'm gonna use uh, flaxseed, uh, linseed oil, and I'm gonna make my own unless I find documentation that says otherwise. So I'm breaking one of my rules. I haven't done, I've tried to do the research. I haven't found anything, but I don't want to uh, put everything else on hold for that. So that I can do the rest of it um, before I get to the sizing. So that's what I'm doing for that. And I'll tell you how I came to that, uh, that I wanted to size, do the warp sizing. So uh, Mistress Karis had a Welsh event in the Setmore Swamp and she asked me to do uh, like a sheep to shawl or something, a fiber that was that had to do with the, the Welsh. So I found a badger face Welsh fleece and I thought we'd do a shawl. And I decided that I would spin up the warp first. This way, when we were at the event, we would just be spinning for the weft. And I brought enough stuff for everybody to do. And I'm like, you know what? I want to practice uh, using singles. And I thought that would also stretch the fiber more. So I did my warp and I did not size it. I, and I'm like, well, let me, let me warp the loom while we're at the event and everybody else could be spinning and I'll be warping and then they'll see how you warp. And then it would be a really nice demonstration, except I couldn't warp it because I didn't, because I didn't size it. Um, and the, the uh, badger fish Welsh is a really springy yarn. And because it was a single, it wasn't balanced. Um, so I pulled it through all the slots and the holes and it was like, bing, it kept curling back up and it was like spaghetti. So I would get like one thing straightened out and then it would spring back up. It was a nightmare um, and I, uh, I couldn't do it. So we still spun and we had a good time and we combed and we carded and we had a really great time. But I came home and I was very frustrated that we didn't get any weaving done. So I'm like, well, let me, let me try and do it. So on the left-hand side, I have the warp put on a warping board. And then I use the linseed oil, use the flax seeds. I had some flax seeds and I boiled it up and I put it on there. So it was nice and gooey and I let it sit and no spring. It was completely straight. I was able to warp up and now I only have a rigid head at the time. I only had a rigid head of loom. So this is important. I had, I just spun warp for whatever, whatever warp size I wanted to make, I just kind of spun it. Not thinking about what the, what the loom could handle. So then I put the warp on there and then I started weaving what we had and we had no regard for what size our singles or our, you know, our applied was gonna be. And as you can see, 
I started weaving and it was too much of an open weave. This, it just not at all what I wanted. So I wound up scrapping the whole thing and really just tossing it out, um, which was kind of hard, but you know what? It was a learning experience. Hopefully it'll be a learning experience for you. You won't make these mistakes. Um, I'm of all the different parts of, of making a fleece to frock project, weaving is the one I have the least experience with. So that's always the thing that I need to research more and ask for help more. Um, and this is a perfect example of how I tried it. And, you know, it was a great learning experience. Next time I'll be much, I'll be ready and uh, it'll come out, it'll come out much better, but it, it was fun. Okay, knitting. Maybe you're not gonna weave, maybe you're gonna knit, maybe you're gonna do nail binding. Uh, there's so many other things that you could be doing where you could be doing embroidery floss, um, but for knitting. So if you're going to do that, what size needles will you use? What's your stitch per inch? What tools will you need? What's your pattern and how much yardage do you need? Um, here I have some stockings that I knit. Now this was with commercial wool. Um, I'm going to be doing some knitted stockings for the person that I'm apprenticed to and I'm doing some hand spun silk for that. So I think that what I'm gonna to do to figure out the yardage that I need is I'm gonna use some commercial yarn that's the same thickness as the silk that I need. And I'm gonna knit, knit some up, maybe knit a whole stocking and see how much yardage that takes. And then that'll tell me what, nor, what yardage I'll need for the silk. Um, it's gonna take some, it's gonna take some sampling. I, I can't just figure it out. You know, you read a pattern and it says you need this much yardage, but when you're spinning it yourself, it might not be the right size um, to equal that yarn. So this is, and also for her measurement. So um, it's gonna be a bit of a work to figure it out, but I, it's, I like knitting with hand spun. It just makes it a little bit special, more special, especially if you dye it yourself, you have control over every aspect of what the finished product looks like. Are you gonna fold your project after you've, after you've woven it? Um, my first project that I did, the Black Walsh, that was the plan, was that I was going to full it. It was just doing a regular tabby weave where it's over one, under one, over one. And then I was going to full it afterwards. So um, that's something you have to think about. It's going to shrink a little bit um, after you do that. So keep that in mind when you're, you're figuring out how much you need to, to spin so that you can weave. So are you going to full it after weaving or after you're done sewing? Will you be fulling by hand or by machine? And what materials and equipment might you require to do the fulling? And where will you be doing it? Now, when I did the fulling, I just did it in my bathtub and I had a plunger, again, not period, uh, but I did research on the period way to do it. But you know, you figure out how you're gonna do it, that'll work out for you. Um, so now you've figured out how you, what your fabric is gonna be, how are you gonna cut and sew? Um, where's the pattern? going to come from that you're you're using to make your garment uh will you do a mock-up first i suggest that you do <laughs> make a mock-up out of fabric that was not something that took you over 100 hours to make <laughs> this way you can make all your mistakes in the pattern and the you know the fitting of the garment before you use your 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 good fabric that's a, that's a good tip for me. <laughs> uh, will you sew by hand? Will you use a machine? Will you use a combination? How will you hem your garment? Again, machine by hand. What stitches will you use? And what materials will you use? Thread, needles, pins. Now, if you're going to be spinning wool and you're gonna be sewing by hand, um, you might wanna think about using some of the, the hand spun that you use. With the wool, over time, it'll kind of felt its way in there and you know it'll match and that'll be a, a nice thing. If you're doing that by machine, might not, you know, I wouldn't put hand spun through my sewing machine, but um, here's some examples of cutting and sewing. On the left-hand side is a cloak. I didn't, I didn't weave this. This was just, I was uh, making a cloak for an elevation. And so this is just, I like to take a picture of every step of the way to give to the recipient of a gift so they can see the, you know, the making of it. Um, so that's just a picture of cutting. And then on the right-hand side is uh, I was doing a sewing tutorial. So that's why I have the, the weird fabric and the, you know, the color thread like that so you could see. So just, you know, taking pictures of every little step and how you do it. If you're gonna sew by hand, 
um, and you're going to research the you know the correct stitches and the period stitches that would have been done something that's also good to have in your documentation so you figured out how you're going to do the patterning for the and cut and sew the garment now let's think about your embellishments uh, what embellishments does your garment require does it need closures how are you going to do that is it going to be buttons is it going to be lacing is it going to be hooks and eyes um, will there be trim or hand embroidered elements on your garment and uh, will you need something for your head if it's a hat or something you know how are you going to do all that go for the whole thing figure out everything ahead of time So another thing that you can you can make with your hand spun is embroidery floss, um, which I touched on a little bit with the dyeing. So I was making uh, the I was doing the embroidery on the tunic for Baron Eric of the Setmore Swamp for his investiture, and we wanted to do something with the swamp heraldry, which is the tower, the sinking tower, and I also wanted to put in some flowers, just as you know something I love to do flowers. And um, wasn't sure what I wanted to do on the tunic or I wasn't sure what he would like. So I did some sampling. I had some uh, store-bought embroidery floss. So I did the, you know, the pattern all in different colors and I did the different motifs. And then he said that mm, he kind of wanted some white on white. He thought that would be a little better. So I'm like, well, I have some hand spun silk. Let me do that. And I showed it to him and he really liked that. So now that's, you know, something else for sampling. It's not always just about to figure out what you want to do. It's very helpful to show other people because for me, describing what my embroidery would look like is not the same as the recipient actually seeing it, especially if it's not a fiber person. Um, so it was what it was very helpful for me to have all these samples for him to choose for what, you know, to see what it would actually look like instead of him trying to imagine what it would look like. Um, again, if I had to do it again, I took some silk that I had already spun and just figured I'd use it for the embroidery floss. It wasn't exact spun exactly the way I would have liked for, for this. It was a little bit uneven. Um, so something that, you know, when you don't use a checklist and don't figure out, you know, then you have to deal with the, the consequences of it. It would have been better if I had done the silk for this project and in the sampling, tried different ways of spinning it in different wraps per inch and, and stuff like that. So now, where are you going to capture all of your information? There is a lot of choices that you have to the modern medievalist. You can put your information on a computer. You can have a journal or a notebook. You can have a folder with loose paper. You can shove it all in a box. Um, and again, don't forget to keep a list of your sources. Um, usually, I use a combination of all of these things when I'm doing research and I'm reading a book, when I know that I'm going to be using information from that book. I have the bibliography going as, as I go. So I decide, yes, this is a book that I'm going to be using. I fill out the bibliography already. So this way I don't have to go back whenever I'm done and figure it out. Um, and then I, uh, you know, I keep track of everything. I like to use a binder. I have one of my binders here. Um, for every project that I'm doing, I keep a binder. And uh, there's a lot of things that I think it's helpful for when, so this binder that you see on the screen is from my fleece to frock two. What I have here is from my fleece to frock one, the one that I said didn't work out. So before I even started that one, I went back to this one and I looked at what I had planned to do, what I did do, and not just for what went wrong, but also for information that I did research so then I didn't have to start from square one and I could find what the, you know, the, the books and the, and the stuff that I had done. Also, um, I keep my samples in there. So then you can see, I have all that whenever I was going to display, I have the samples that I used. And in this one, I also kept track of my hours. So that's how I know it took me over a hundred, just over a hundred hours of work to do the um, this project. And so I just kept it on notebook paper. I just kept it next to my wheel. And every time I did something, I washed it, I carded it, I spun it. I just put it right there, the weaving. And uh, I just kept track of it. And also I put the date on there so you could see how long it took. Um, and then I just have it, I'm gonna keep it on the shelf. 
And then also in the beginning is my, I kept my write-up when I was finished and I did a display of that, then the write-up goes in there. So I have the same thing for the binder on the screen. You see the, the upper left, you see the finished binder. In the middle is that picture I showed you that I had. I liked, I'm old school. And uh, back in the day, you went to the library and you had to photocopy your book. <laughs> so I still do that. Um, I, I print things out and highlight it and uh, I'll take notes. You'll see that in the, the bottom left, I have pictures of spindles that are appropriate for my region and time period of the dress that I'm gonna be doing. So even though most of it is gonna be spun on my wheel, I will be spinning some of it on those spindles so that you, and I will mark that on the samples so that people can see that. Um, and then on the next picture over, I have some of my, some of my notes that I have taken. And then the next picture over is the documentation I've taken from the different uh, vendors when I bought the fleeces. And then in the back, just some random things um, that I have. I have a really nice postcard that shows weaving and spinning so that, you know, in the time period that I'm doing it so people can get an idea. Um, and it just, it's helpful to keep it all in one place. And this way, also the checklist, when you fill out the checklist, that goes right in the front. Um, so you have it all in one place and it's easier to find and easier to look at it and check in as you go through the project to make sure you're doing, you know, everything that you had set out to do. Another thing that I like to do is fill out a rough draft of arts and science questionnaires. If you're planning on doing an arts and science project, um, you, you know, you, or you may be on the fence, but I, whenever I do an arts and science competition, I try and keep a copy of the blank questionnaire um, on my computer so I can go back to it. And, and, um, and it helps me to make sure that in planning my project, I'll be able to answer the questions that are asked. There's kind of like a basic set of questions that most of them ask. Sometimes they're specialized and there's some extra ones. Um, but I, you know, if I try to fill them out, other than, you know, how did I, you know, what went wrong and with making it and stuff, I can't answer that yet, but I'll make sure that I could, I could answer the questions. Um, and I'll share that with you later on. Uh, I have a blank one that you can use. I, I uh, was given a really good piece of advice to talk about the project that you're working on to other people. Um, discuss the project with friends, mentors, go to an a &S consultation table, other artisans that are experienced in that area, you will get some really great feedback and you never know where your assistance is gonna come from. I don't worry about people stealing my idea um, because I feel like if five of us got together and did the exact same project, it would come out five different ways because we all have a different take on it. So I think the benefits to talking to other people about your project far outweigh anything that of not talking to it. Um, you never know where you're gonna find information or inspiration. Um, a friend of mine who's a period cook was the one who told me about the carcacole sheep. He was looking for fat-tailed sheep for cooking in a recipe. And he asked me if I had any information on that sheep and I didn't. So then I found out all about that sheep. Well, there's another period sheep that I didn't know about. Um, I asked another friend who isn't a fiber person uh, about my problems with trying to find documentation on the warp sizing. And she suggested look in a farm manual because farm manuals would tell you how to do everyday thing like weaving and spinning or um, you know, some maybe some books on housewifery. There's a couple of books that were written that were supposed to be guides for housewife for how to do that. So there's some great places that I never thought to look in. Um, you may be able to borrow tools or books that help you do a project or point you to the appropriate vendors. Um, so my apprentice sister and I really want to process some flax, but we just want to process a little bit of flax. We don't want to do the whole thing ourselves because that's really hard work. Um, so if we just want to do a bunch of it just to experience it and be able to have pictures and know what it's like, I'm not, we're not going to want to buy or make a flax break and ha hackles and all that stuff. So uh, she knew of a place that we can go to a farm and they you know, they have a thing where you can come and process some flax. So that is great. If I never told her about that, I would still be sitting there going, oh, I wish I could do that. Um, so that's, that's something that you can talk to people about. And 
talking to people about your projects will help you avoid pitfalls. Hopefully me telling you about all the dumb mistakes that I've made in the course of doing these projects will keep you from doing that and help you help you with it. Also, um, if you know somebody else who's familiar with the, what you're doing, they can help you proofread. They can help you with your documentation. Always good to have another set of eyes on, on your, your documentation for proofreading. Um, I encourage you to share your project with the known world. And it's helpful to think about it early in the pro process, how you might go about doing that. So even if your project is not intended to be in an arts and science display, there's other ways that you can, you can share it. And so you might want to think about how you'll keep your, your information about it. You can post it to social media. If you're doing that, you might want to do it as you go, or you could do it at the end. So if you're going to be doing it on social media, that's going to be taking a lot of pictures. You're going to want to take a lot of pictures of what you're doing. Um, you could post it to your blog another thing you know then you're going to want to think about how to write it up and maybe you might want to be writing down if you're going to do it after the project is over write down little things that happen um, and document it so it'll be interesting um, that you might not remember what happened when you were washing your fleece if it was six months ago um, you might want to make a tutorial pdf i've done this in the past for several things and put it up in our baronese facebook group you can add files to the group and this is a really helpful, especially when new members, if you get new members in, you could point them to the to there and then they can, you know, have a whole bunch of PDFs right there at their fingertips. Also, you know, I keep them whenever I'm teaching a class and then I have it and I can give it to people if they ask me about it or if they're gonna be doing a class, you know, and they wanna see how I do my handouts. Um, you can also teach a formal or informal class. This could be in person or here in Zoom. Um, you could teach a class at Pensick, at an event, at a Shire or Barony meeting or gathering, or like I said, at Zoom. So um, it was really, it took a lot for me to teach at Pensick the first time. I was very nervous about doing it, but I felt like all the years that I love taking all those classes, I feel like I should give back. And you, I think we underestimate our knowledge and what we have and what we've done um, that there's always someone who will learn from it. Even if you're not an expert in your field, you've still done it and you still have something that, that can share. And there's always someone who's newer than you are, um, or maybe somebody who's advanced, but you've done something in a way they've never thought of. So don't be afraid to teach a class. Um, at events, a lot of times I love the, um, the artisan's row that we've been doing. And so then people can just come up and see what you're doing. And it's, it's great. It's a, also a great way to fall down a rabbit hole and find a new craft, but it's, it's informal and I'm not just talking to people. So you're not standing in front of somebody. Um, another thing is our, our barony, some uh, used to do in the before times, we used to do ga gatherings called Swamp Stomp and it's like garb optional and it's kind of just a potluck hangout. But I've taught classes at that. And again, it could be informal just, hey, how did you do this? Um, so, you know, I taught knitting, knitting stockings and it wasn't so much, I had a handout, but it was more a just, let me show you how to, how to knit it. It was very informal. Um, and then the Zoom, there's, um, there was some really great people online. If you look on YouTube in the medieval world who will show you how you can do, do this. There's a lot of tutorials, even mundanely, how to, how to do, uh, virtual classes and stuff like that. I might be doing some that I hope to add to the Barony website too. Um, and feel free to reach out. This is, I think the sixth time I've tried to record this. Um, I did one for Pensick University and my sound was all off. Hopefully this one will work, um, but you know, just do it. It's, it's better to do it than to not do it. Absolutely. Another thing you can do is you can publish in your Barony newsletter. And that could be just as simple as, oh, look, I did a thing. Um, or just, you know, some simple steps for how you've done it. Um, you can publish in Tournaments Illuminated. They're always looking for articles and the editors will help you. And, or you can publish a complete anachronist, um, which is something that I did. Um, I had a project that I had started as a demo. Um, I just put together different uh, breeds. And I also included linen and cotton and flax and hemp 
and different sheep breeds of medieval fibers. And it started from going to demos and I wanted to have something for the public to see what different types of things could be spun, not just sheep's wool. And then I, I got a little bit more information. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna enter it into my arts and science competition for my baronial. And I won, it was great. Um, I was really proud of it. And then I, I was like, you know what? Maybe I'm gonna do some other arts and science competitions around the kingdoms. And I went to St. Allegis and that was great. And I was really excited. It went really well. Then I used it for the war point. I put a little bit more polish on it had a little bit better display. And um, so I did it at the at Penzik for a war point. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna do arts and science, Kings and Queens arts and science. And I did that and it really did not fit at all into, into that uh, competition, what I had done. And it was nothing wrong necessarily with what I did, the project itself. But when I started the project, it was for a demo. So it was not, I did not have Kings and Queens a &S in mind. Most of the other things that I did with it, I did not have in mind. Um, so it was kind of a bummer because my feedback wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted to hear. And I, I realize now it didn't fit. My fleece to, to frock project that I'm doing right now is with that a &S competition in mind. So my checklist is geared towards that. So I had gone to an arts and science consultation table, talked to them about, you know, how I felt about the project and they suggested, why not, why not uh, publish it? And I thought about Tournaments Illuminated and it was really too much information for Tournaments Illuminated. So as nervous as I was, I put out, uh, you know, I reached out to the complete anachronist and they're like, we'd love to have it. And fantastic, except I certainly did not have that in mind when I did all my research. So it was not in the right format. It was not written for the right audience. And the, bibli the bibliography and the um, annotation was certainly not right for a complete anachronist. Luckily, the editor is super awesome and held my hand and took me through all the steps. So I went with a completed project and it took maybe another six to eight months before it was ready to be published. And it was a fantastic experience. And now that I've been through it, if I had another project that I thought I would want to give to the complete anachronist, I would in the beginning with the checklist go through it and I would not have to be six to eight months of trying to retrofit a project for that. So this is why it's also very important to think about how you're gonna share it in the beginning. Um, and it, it will just make it go smoother um, you know, later on when you're finally done with everything and putting it all together uh, for whatever you're going to, to show it off with. So some of the resources that you can have available to you. The first thing is the Fleece and Fiber Source Book. This is something that mundane and medieval people love. It is by Deborah Robson and Carl Acarius. It has 200 different types of fiber animals, and it says where they're from and what their fiber is like and different things you can do with it and different ways to process it and is so completely awesome. And it's what really started me with thinking, oh, I wanna do uh, a breed study, a medieval breed study of different fibers. That was, was the jumping off point for me. And I just, I use this still all the time um, as a starting point to look up stuff about sheep and then I'll do my, you know, the looking into whether it's period or not. Um, another thing is the complete anachronist that I did. Um, so this is, this is it, you can get it on the SEA website. Um, and this is really, we geared it towards people who are new and who haven't had a lot of fiber experience. So it has a lot of, you know, different, different fibers that you can use and also ideas for what to do with it and areas that it would be, you know, different regions of the world where the different fibers would be used. So, um, you know, I encourage you to use it as your jumping off point. It certainly has a lot to go. I didn't even touch, there's so many fibers I didn't even get to put in there. Um, but I encourage you to use it and then, you know, go and do your own research. Um, there's a video, Three Bags Full by Judith McKenzie. Um, it's a video, it's, it's for the modern spinner but she details how to purchase, separate, store, clean, process, and spin a raw fleece. 
it's by Long Thread Media. You can go to their website and purchase it. And I wish I had this before I started buying fleeces because when I first started, I had no idea what I was doing. And I bought some pretty crummy fleeces. And now I have a better idea of what I'm looking for and what I'm, you know, some warning signs that the fleece isn't gonna be so good for what I want. Um, so that's something. Um, hand spinning rare wools, how to spin them and why we should care. This is by Deb Deborah Robson. And this was a companion video to go with the fleece and fiber source book. Um, but it has some more information on rare breeds, which a lot of uh, the breeds that are medieval, considered medieval, fall under rare. Um, and so a lot of the fleece and how to spin it, um, some of the tips she does in there are helpful. Also, I like that she she does, she kind of does her trial and error. She shows you her methodology of, well, do I want to comb it? Do I want to card it? Do I want to flick it? And it just, you get to see her process. And I think that's really helpful. It really helped me uh, understand how you can play around. And, you know, there isn't one way that's the right way to process it. You have to really see what your fleece that you have and the wool or cotton or linen in front of you, how it should be processed because it's not all the same depending on where it came from. Um, some websites that I find useful, longthreadmedia.com. They publish spin-off, handwoven piecework, and some other magazines. They have really great instructional DVDs and downloadable, downloadable videos. And they also publish books. Um, even though it's mostly geared, it's geared towards modern spinners, like spin-off will every once in a while have a, you know, a classic breed, or they'll have tools that haven't changed over time, or they'll focus on a, uh, you know, a tool from another country and they give you the history. So, you know, there's some good gems and, uh, you know, talk to your friends. I have a subscription. I can, you know, point people, oh, I have this article. And if you get an online subscription, uh, you get access to all the back issues, which is awesome. Um, and then Ravelry.com, uh, that's a social network for knitters and crocheters, but there's hand spinners and weavers. There's um, uh, medieval textile artists, I'm on there as Foxy Fiber Chick. Um, so you can find me there. I'm not on there too much, but if you send me a message, I'll get there. But there's a lot of uh, good information there that you can find and talk to other people who are doing what you do from, you know, from all over. Um, here's my information, if you want that. My email is craftynara at gmail.com. I encourage you, if you wanna reach out to me and tell me what you're working on, if you have any questions, be happy to talk to you about it. I love talking about fiber projects on Facebook. I'm Heather Caselli Fox. Um, I do a lot of medieval stuff on Facebook. Um, and then of course my Ravelry. Uh, okay, so that's the end of this, but I do want to open up and show you the checklist. Let's see. So here's my project checklist. Now this is very, um, you know, generic and you can change it however you want. If you know, you're not gonna be doing weaving but you're gonna be doing nail binding or you're gonna be doing knitting or embroidery, whatever you're gonna do, you can change it to however you want. So, you know, the project name, garment details, how it's being made, is there an extant piece? You know, all, let's go down the thing. What culture is it from? Um, hopefully I'll have a link to this so that um, you can get to it. Otherwise you can send me an email and I'll happily send it to you. And, you know, even if it's not a spinning project, this is something that you could use for other projects as well. It's just all the things you wanna think about. And a project like this is really big and hopefully I didn't make it seem too overwhelming for you, but if you break it up into pieces, it'll be a lot more doable. If you think about it as the spinning part, and the cleaning part and the fiber prep part. You know, it's not, it's not so hard. It's, you know, the whole big thing of it is, is too big. Uh, embellishments. So that's a checklist. Okay. And then I wanna show you the arts and science questions. Okay, so this is just a sample questions. What did you make or do? Uh, what is the connection between your entry and a medieval item or practice? 
would your entry have been made or done in period? How would it have been made or done in period? Uh, what, how was yours made it done? Now, can't really answer that, but until it's done, you can think about how you're going to be differentiating. And so that's something you wanna think about before you do it, how you're gonna document that. What are some of the similarities and differences in materials, process, and tools and approach? What inspired you? Something that you wanna think about maybe before you did it, before you do the project. What is your favorite part of preparing your entry? Again, might not be able to be answered to the end, but something you can keep in your mind. What would you do differently? Really a question for the end. Uh, what references and sources would you recommend? How would you find, how did you find your sources of information? Something that you should be thinking about beforehand, because like I said, you know, if it took me a year or two before I did my, the finished project to when I did the research, I'm not going to remember where I got some of those things from. So, you know, write down, you can write down where you got it from. Um, and did you find a connection to a medieval artisan while working? So that again is an end question. But these are good things to think about, um, especially like I said, you know, my one project didn't really fit into the, you know, into the mold. Um, so for the project that I'm doing now that I want to be in arts and science, Kings and Queens arts and science, whatever year I get it finished, um, you know, thinking about this helps me make sure that I'm, I'm gearing the project towards that. Um, so that's, that's all I have. Um, I hope that you found this helpful. Please contact me if you have questions or comments and um, good luck to you. Be kind to each other and hopefully we'll get to meet each other soon. Thank you.